Good day, every nation, Stellenbosch, and uh, welcome to church. Welcome to church online. So glad that you've uh, joined us in. I pray that you're going to have a blessed, blessed, blessed day as you worship, as you hear God's word. It's just always so encouraging. So welcome for myself, Mark, and my wife, Marion. So glad that you uh, joined us, and uh, may you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. If you are joining us for the first time, we want to extend a really warm welcome to you. And so it's great that you're here, here online with us. And we just trust that you're, you'd really, three things that we're about as a church, and we trust you'd experience, is that really that you'd encounter Christ, that you'd experience Him right in your home where you are, that you'd also be connected with us, that you can experience community, and that also from here, there'd be a passion in your heart to go and extend God's kingdom. So on that note, if you'd like to know more about us as a church and how you can get connected, possibly in a connect group that meets in the week, or if you'd like to know about prayer meetings that are happening, other events on our calendar, there's a lot happening in the life of our church. So don't you want to send a WhatsApp to the number on the screen? And that's our WhatsApp line, and we'll get in touch with you and keep you updated. But yes, welcome to church and welcome to family. We trust that you'd be so blessed being here. Before I hand back to Mark, just want to say congratulations if you have celebrated anything in this last week. Perhaps a wedding anniversary, a promotion, a, a test went super well if you're a student, or you're just experiencing just God's goodness. We want to celebrate with you if it was a birthday and say congratulations. May you just continue to just experience God's goodness and His favor over your life in this year ahead and be super, super blessed. That's great. Thank you, Mary. So, two quick announcements. Firstly, we are meeting back again. So. We are 9.30 um, at the Stellenbosch High School. We'll be meeting outdoors while the weather's good. If the weather is not so good, we'll be indoors. We've got Kids Church happening there. There's space for 250 at the moment, um, indoors and uh, lots of space uh, outdoors. In the evening, we've got two service times, five o'clock and 6.30 this Sunday, both at Stellenbosch High School, and they can fit 250 indoors. So come along. Uh, bring some friends. It's going to be just a fantastic time. Um, another thing that we're running in a couple of weeks' time, something we call Victory Training, and it's on the 19th and the 20th of April. So make a note of it, because this is a moment that we don't want you to miss. And we love the fact that because of Jesus and everything he did, we can walk in freedom. And God wants you free, free from things that perhaps your past, that you've bought with from your past, perhaps things that you're encountering at the moment. We want to create a space where you can sit under teaching, get into God's word, and really that you hear truth on things that then God can set you free in these areas. Perhaps some relational pain or an addiction, some, some things in your mind, or perhaps even things that you've believed that are contrary to God's word. Come along to Victory Training. It's the 19th and the 20th of April, and you know, a two-day, almost like a retreat moment where you can, you, know, you can really encounter Jesus and trust that change is going to come in your own life. So mm. you can sign up online for that. All the details, the cost, the time, the place, everything is on our website. So go have a look there. Yeah, it really is just a fantastic time. God wants us free. That's why he died. And he also wants us free in our finances. I want to read a scripture as we just have our generosity moment. Proverbs eleven twenty four says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. It's amazing how when we give appropriately in God's kingdom, it frees us and it also produces a harvest. Sometimes when we withhold what we sh where we should be helping somebody else, our kind of our worlds get small and we don't see the fullness of what God is wanting to release in our lives. So uh, really just an amazing scripture in Proverbs 11. Have a read. And I want to just also thank those of you that are giving generously to us as a church family to be able to allow us to do what we do just to see God's kingdom being extended in so many areas, helping so many different people. It truly is a great blessing. So thank you so much for that. There's the snap scan as usual or our bank details online. But yeah, even as we go now into just a time of worship, uh, Fifi is going to be speaking and delivering the message later today and just about um, how God's spirit is poured out and how God wants us to live a spirit empowered life. So as we go into worship before that, let's be expectant, expectant for God to move, expectant for God to meet with you there in your room, uh, wherever you might be watching today. Open your heart, lift up a shout of praise, and let's just invite the Lord to only do what He can do. Have an incredible rest of your day. God bless everybody.
to worship, then praise. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll sing your name. We'll sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We'll sing with all we are and claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift tonight. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. song that overcomes the rage and sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on us. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh we praise you. Oh, 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 we praise you. Oh, 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 this is what, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift in my with our creation cry, God, we praise you. Good morning, every nation, Stellenbosch. Welcome to our online service. And um, I'm so excited to be taking part in this, in this series, A New Hope, which is about the third person of the Trinity. I can't think of anything more I would like to do at this moment than talk about our great friend, the Holy Spirit. So I've, I've got a message that I've entitled, When God Comes to Church. Let me pray. And then let's get into this. Father, I thank you that you have a purpose this morning. You want to draw close. You want to touch the hearts and the lives of your people. You want to reveal who you are. And this morning, Father, I pray that as I speak and as they listen, that we would be transformed and that our lives would be expanded to contain more of your presence and your life. Amen. So, like I mentioned, when God comes to church is the title of my message. Now, a while ago, I read a story, a while ago, a few years ago, and the story impacted me deeply. And now, years later, I'm surprised it impacted me so deeply. It was a story about uh, John Wimber, 
and he had come to South Africa and he preached a series of messages, short 12 minute messages. And, and the message was the same. Each message he would say, God says, I want my church back. God says, I want my church back. And, and I think the thing that impacted me most about that was those words, my church. And I think all of a sudden, as I was hearing that message, as I was reading it, I started thinking about God's church. And it was so profound to me that as obvious as it sounds, it's his church that when we come together as this church, the most important thing should be that God is felt, experienced, known, and encountered because it's his church and that God loves to show himself. He loves to be in his church. He loves to be the center. His presence is the center of what the gathered church is about. So that's what this message really is about. It's about when God fills everything, when his presence and his power and his person and his thoughts are so tangible, so close, so near, so real to us. And so I'm going to share with you from Acts, if you would read with me, Acts 2, starting from verse 14 down to verse 21, and then from 32 again down to verse 39. So this is Peter, and he is explaining a moment where God has shown up among the church, and he has to explain what's going on. And so this is, this is what's happening. Verse 14. When Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose, it is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both young men and women, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we drop down to verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So the first, I've got three points, and the first one is more than we expect. Now, here's a short summary of the Bible. It's not the whole Bible, but it's the, a short summary. God made us to be close to him. We sinned and walked away from him. The Father longed to be close to us, so he sent Jesus so he could be close to us. And then Christ, when he ascended, wanted to stay close and be closer still. So he sent the Spirit. Like I said, it's not the whole summary, but I hope you see from that, that the longing of God is to be close to his people. There's nothing that God loves more than to be near us. That's always been in his heart. 
and will always be in his heart. And when the final day is over, you see the end of the Bible, the end of the book in Revelation, it shows God dwelling and close to his people. That's God's heart. Now, one of the things that really stands out about the passage that we just read, the picture that God gave Joel, which notice it says, in the last days, God says, I will. And when God says, I will, we need to take it seriously. We need to go, wow, what is God saying he will do? And here it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I'll pour out my spirit. And the word they pour, it's not a, it's not a word that, um, that is a scientific word. It speaks about extravagance and passion and generosity. In fact, when you read the biblical the Bible dictionary, the, this was the, the explanation of the Greek word to pour. To give in abundance, to bestow generously. To give in abundance and to bestow generously. So you hear from Joel, the heart of God, to pour himself out on his people. To pour on himself. Now, I remember sitting with someone and uh, I asked him, how much sugar do you want in your coffee? I said, one spoon? He said, no. I said, two spoons? He said, no. I said, three spoons? He said, no. He said, just pour. <laughs> now, in this case, I was horrified, but, but the idea was this. I just want a lot of sugar. I want it to be really sweet. And when you say, how does God want us to experience him? He says, I want to pour out myself. Can you hear those words? In fact, so much of the Bible's talk about the Holy Spirit is in such experiential words and such abundant words, experiential words. If you look in the Bible and you see, look in the Old Testament about the promises and, and throughout the Old Testament, God is promising a time and Joel uses the word in the last days. Sometimes people think of that as talking about some future age, but it's actually talking about the moment from when Christ rose until he comes again. So these are the last days and he's saying, I will pour. So in our time, this season, you and me, God desires to pour out the spirit. Can you hear the word pour? So much of the words for God describing how the Holy Spirit will be experienced by his church is experiential words. Pour. He speaks about rivers pouring out. He speaks about fire, which is also experiential. He speaks about thirst and hunger. And, and those, those words all point to an experience. It's funny to me that so much of the Bible language about the Holy Spirit is experiential. And so much of our language about the Holy Spirit, even in the church, is theoretical and technical. In this passage of Scripture, the, we see the writer not pushing us towards some theoretical concept, but to say, what would it be like for God to pour himself out on his people? For one, it would be experienced and known, and it would be abundance. When you pour, it's abundant. I remember what, once again, John Wimber, I remember hearing uh, John Wimber talk about having this vision. And in this vision, he, he saw a honeycomb and, and you know, like where, where you get honey from. And uh, as he looked up at the honeycomb, it was dripping and there were people below and um, it was landing on some and they were smiling and laughing and tasting and just experiencing it. And then there was another group of people who were like wiping it off and they were like, Oof. and... John said, God, what is this? And the Lord said to him, John, it's my mercy. And I'm pouring out my mercy. And there's enough for everyone. It's my mercy. And when it comes to God, this is the most important thing, I think, about talking about the Holy Spirit, is we have to realize that God desires for us to experience his spirit, to experience himself. God loves, like I said, to be near his people. And so this passage of scripture and what's going on, it's God extravagantly pouring himself on his people. And that's his desire. 
It's really, really important that we see that. Notice even here in this passage, it says, exalted to the right hand, this is verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out what you see and hear. See and hear. Once again, experiential terms. In Luke 11, verse 13, this scripture blows my mind. In Luke 11, verse 13, it says, If imperfect parents know how to lovingly care for their children and give them what they need, how much more will the perfect Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit's fullness when His children ask Him? Do you hear that? So it's this idea of normal parents who have, you know, they know how to give good gifts. But he's saying, can you see the perfect heart of the Father? And the perfect heart of the Father, it says, God freely gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And what astonishes me about this is two things. For one, obviously, the generous heart of the Father, that God, that, that God can outgive any human person. The kindest, most generous person. God doesn't even compare in his desire to share and give and give to us. And so it's so important that we get God's heart and that he wants to give of the Holy Spirit. And the second thing is this, that the best gift we could ever receive, as, as you see in the scripture, is the Holy Spirit. Nothing we desire could compare with receiving more of the Holy Spirit. And so I've labored at the beginning of this message to say, let's expect more. Let's, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, let's not get this small idea, the ideas of lavish experience of the person of God. That's what he wants to do in the Holy Spirit. The second thing I want to share, which is, which is closely linked, is everybody gets, gets it. Everybody gets it. So, do you guys remember, <laughs> it's been almost immortalized by Trevor Noah, uh, Oprah, the Oprah show, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, Oprah used to have these times where she would give gifts to the people who came on her show. And Oprah would come out and go, everybody's getting one, everybody's getting one. And she would give, you're getting one, and you're getting one, and you're getting one, and you're getting one. And just by being on the show, it meant that you were getting one of those gifts. Now, if you look, and when I, when, I, when I read it, you're going to be like, that is so obvious. How did I miss that? Or maybe you didn't miss it, but it's something that stands out from this passage that I read, and I'm going to reread it. Verse 17 and 18 says, Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Verse 18, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And then verse 39 says this, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now you would have to be blind to miss that point. It says, I'm pouring out my spirit on old men, young men men and women and then the the scripture later on in, in 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 verse 30 was it 39 says and this is for you it's for your children and it's for you know their children and for all whom the lord would call and so the point is all the point is this for everybody everybody's getting it isn't it funny how we often think of all these distinctions why we can't be full of the Spirit. And, and, and that idea, remember I said God wants to pour out. And, and so some of the terms that, that, that the scripture uses are things like fill, pour out. So from God's side is pouring out. From our side, God says fill. And the idea of filling is that we are so overflowing with a sense of who he is. Now, 
it's worth make, making this point, and I, I didn't make this point earlier, but it's important to say this, is that when it talks about God pouring out his spirit, the spirit is not an it or a thing. It's not like water. He's a person. But the idea of being full of the spirit, of God pouring out his spirit, is that God draws so near to us, so near to you and to me, that it's almost like being dumped or like a bucket of water was poured on us. No one would say, wow, when the water was poured on you, did you get wet? Of course you got wet. I got soaked to my very being. And so the, this, the promise of God's Holy Spirit is that we can be so full of his personhood, of his thoughts, of his power, of his passion, of who he is, that it's almost like we were dipped or flooded or covered in water. So back to my point about everybody's getting one. Isn't it funny how when we speak about the spirit like that, flooding, covering, we often think of a special class of people who get it. But the scripture is making the point here. It says, everyone, it's going into saying, if you can imagine, are you a man or a woman? It's for you. Are you a child or an adult? And it's no matter how far you are from that generation, this promise stands true for you. I want to fill, I want to flood. I want them to know me so closely, so deeply. I want to be near my people. That is the promise of God. I love the word promise because the promise extends to everyone. You know, there's, a, there's an incident that's described in John 7 where it was the, the feast of, of, of Pentecost and what would happen, no, the feast of harvest. Um, and uh, what would happen is that the priest would the priests and, and the religious order would do this elaborate ceremony for days. And what they would do is they would go and fetch water and they would come and they would go down to the river and everyone would be going along with them and there'd be music and celebration. But there would be this religious service and there'd be golden vessels and they would pour out. These were the selected priests. And there was an entire ritual that would celebrate God pouring out uh, water from heaven in the desert and and God's protection and provision for the harvest and and well, these were all good things but something startling happens in the midst of all of that you read in John 7 and it says on the last and greatest day of the festival so when the passion was greatest when this procession and the people were most spellbound by this by what was going on in this religious ceremony, Jesus stands up in the middle of that and this is what he says he says it he says he shouted loudly Anyone who is thirsty, come. <laughs> come to me and drink. And like I've said, rivers of living water will flow out of his belly, speaking about the Holy Spirit. Can you hear Jesus' message? He's in the middle of all this religious procession and formulas and, and all the things of how you do it and, and this religious life. Jesus says, okay, I'm the true source of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? It's for whoever is thirsty. Whoever. He just completely changes. Can you hear the raw call? If you're thirsty, it's for you. No procession needed. No ceremony. He's saying, do you know what? You're right. Your entry level. Do you want to know if you qualify to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Well, if you're thirsty, you're an overachiever because it's your, it's your lucky day. My presence, the fullness of what I've got is for those who are thirsty. You know, sometimes we can almost forget. We can go through life and forget just how thirsty we are just how desperately in need 
of the fullness of the Spirit we are. And Jesus says, all you need to do to receive this, because like I mentioned, the Father's heart is to pour out the fullness of who he is. All you need is to say, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. And he'll fill. I'm thirsty. I need this. I can't go through life just doing things as they are. I need more of you, Jesus. I need more of your presence, Holy Spirit. Would you flood me? You know, an ironic point is that the things that often make us feel so disqualified from the fullness of the Spirit. You know, sometimes oh, I'm like a mom. I, I don't spend enough time with Jesus. I don't have time. Uh, uh, or, or, you know, my area of struggle or my area of sin or all the things that we put as this disqualifies me from more of God are the very things that are signs that we are thirsty and actually qualify us to receive more of the Holy Spirit. The last point I'll share is when God shows up. Now for this final point, what I wanna, what I wanna, where I wanna go is I wanna take a, a bit of a, a big picture view of what's going on in the scripture. See, Acts was written by Luke and Luke, wrote the book by his name, the Gospel of Luke, and then he went on to Acts. And in the Gospel of Luke, the primary thing he does is he talks about Jesus, and he talks about Jesus' life. And, and you, what you see from Luke is that everywhere that Jesus goes, the miraculous, the power of God, the heart of God, transformation, um, the Gospel, the Kingdom, are all breaking out. And you see Jesus, you see healings taking place, you see demons leaving, and you you see Miracles, you see, love like you can't believe and you go, wow, that's incredible. And we should go, wow, and go, I can't even believe that could even happen. But a, a, a curious thing begins to happen. So some very ordinary, flawed individuals in Luke come around Jesus. And you know what begins to happen? The very things that you see in the life of Jesus begin to happen in their lives just because Jesus is near and present with them. And so in Luke 10 actually even shows this time when the guys, the disciples, very ordinary people with flaws, fighting, bickering, um, I mean really ordinary people, and they, they go out and they come back and they say, Jesus, what was happening with you is happening with us demons are leaving, people are healed. Can you believe it? They're stunned. Jesus goes, Yeah. <laughs> so not only is the miraculous happening, they're as stunned as we are. And then we move on from Luke, and, and, and Acts is almost like an extension of the ministry of Jesus happening. And you see what I described when I read this that portion of scripture, and you see God visiting his people and coming close again. Remember I said, Jesus, when he was leaving, wanted to stay close to his people, so the Spirit is poured out, and that's the passage that I read. But you notice what happens here, is that God begins to demonstrate, and you see the ministry of Jesus again right here, exploding out here, as you see um, the gospel being preached to, to unbelievers, and you see miracles, and but as you look through the book of Acts, you see the very same thing that happened in the ministry of Luke. And that's this. You see the church with the presence and the nearness of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit, close to his people. And the things that happened in Luke, that happened in the ministry of Jesus, begin to happen in his church. Now, why this is so vital is because often we read the book of Luke and we go, oh, I'm going to read about some amazing things that will inspire me, but I don't have any faith to actually see them happening in my own life and the day today. And the scriptures are saying, you know, I know you see yourself as ordinary, and that is true. But the extraordinary God, when he draws near, begins to express himself 
through his people. You know, whenever you speak about the Holy Spirit, Spirit people goes, okay, what do you mean when you speak of the Holy Spirit? Are you, are you talking about gifts of the Spirit? Are you talking about tongues? Are you talking about miracles? Are you talking about evangelism? And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Because you see, when God draws close to his people, God shows himself to his people and God shows himself through his people. And so when I'm speaking about more of the Holy Spirit, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about allowing God to be God in the midst of his people. You see, when, when God shows up at church, the church becomes the church. So let me, let, me, let me just say this. So Jesus had this close, beautiful relationship with his Father. When you read the Gospels, you see Jesus had this intimate relationship with the Father. But you know what happens when God shows up? He gives us a prayer language. And this prayer language allows us to have this greater intimacy with the Father. And, and, and so we hear him and we experience him and he experiences us. And it's, it's just, so, so it's not about tongues. It's about, it's about God showing up. And so Jesus hated sickness. So you know what happens when the Holy Spirit descends on his church, when the fullness of God is poured out on his church? You begin to see healings happen in his church. Have you noticed here that when it describes the account in Acts, it says they were all telling the wonders of Jesus in the languages of the nations. Now, these believers, I can tell you what, you, you actually see it in Acts that they, they didn't yet have this picture of the gospel must go to the ends of the earth. So how is it that they were sharing the gospel and sharing Jesus to people all over that's the heart of Jesus, and it's being seen in his people. You just, all of a sudden, you see the heart of Jesus expressed through his people, and all of a sudden, you see the languages of the nation. You see, God translates the gospel to other hearts. Jesus loves to connect with people where they're at, in their culture, in their language, in their different circumstances. And so that is what you begin to see happen with the church. Even before they realize in their heads, experientially, all of a sudden, they're expressing the heart of God for people around them. You know, some, some of us go, no, no, I'm not courageous and I, I can't share the gospel or, or I'm not super spiritually gifted. Friends, can we take our eyes off ourselves for a moment? It's as simple as realizing that the outpouring of the Spirit is for His church. And the reason why I'm so excited to share this message is this. It's for you and for me. And the simple thing we do is we learn that the Father's heart is bursting forth with a passion to share of himself. When we speak about the Holy Spirit, it's God drawing close to his people. And it's for everyone. It's for, there's nothing in your past that can disqualify you. There's nothing in your personality that makes you less of a candidate. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do you want more? There's more for you. And like I mentioned, let's not get so caught up on what it'll look like. Let's allow God to be God. So very, very practically, what, how did it happen in the scriptures? And because most of you who would be seeing this message are watching it online, I'll make this really simple. Asking. Simply asking and waiting and just begin to pray and say, Jesus, would you fill me? He desires to. And he will fill you with more of his presence. And the second way, which is, which is actually getting it from Jesus as well, is asking. But it's, we see this pattern in scripture and we see just saying, asking believers, maybe your connect group leader, maybe whoever it is, Someone who is, who is a spiritual believer and just saying, would you pray for me to be baptized, to be filled with God, with the Spirit of God? And Jesus says, I will repeat what I did then. I long to pour out my Spirit on you. I long to fill you. I long for you to experience me and see my power, my presence, my heart expressed in you. 
So friends, it's as simple as asking. So I'm gonna pray. I'm not gonna make it this super uh, strange or unusual prayer because this is, this is normal. This is God's heart for us as a church. So I'm gonna pray. Trust God to fill you with more of himself. Holy Spirit, I pray for every person who's listening and I pray for myself. I ask for a, a pouring out, an experience of the Spirit of God. I ask that our lives would never be the same again. I pray, Father, would you come to your church? Would you make your church live as your church? I pray for those moms, for those business people, for those students, for everyone who would listen and say, I'm thirsty. Holy Spirit, would you pour out? We leave the results of what will happen to you. Flood us in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, church. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. See you soon. Blessings. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God. Sing.